Hello, I'm Claudius, Application Scientist at Zurich Instruments. If you're looking for hints and tips how to use signal conditioning to improve your lock and amplifier measurements, this video will help. Let's jump to the first. Selecting the best input range is crucial to obtain good measurements. You need to set it large enough to avoid clipping your signal and small enough to exploit the full range of the input analog to digital converter. Since lock-in amplifiers do not proactively change the input range, you'll need to select the range considering the evolution of the signal throughout the entire measurement. The next tip is to remove your DC offset. A large DC component at the input can use up most of the lock-in's dynamic reserve, resulting in reduced measurement performance. Setting the input to AC coupling adds a high-pass filter on the input path that removes the DC offset. The cutoff frequency of this filter is different for each lock-in model, so ensure that your signal's frequency is high enough to avoid attenuation. And it's not just DC. You should consider unwanted dynamical signals as well. This will avoid unwanted frequency components dominating the input and thus preventing the use of the best input range for the signal of interest. One way to do this is to employ an appropriate external bandpass filter centered on the signal of interest and suppress the parasitic components. An alternative approach is to generate the signal identical in frequency and amplitude to the spurious component and feed it into the differential input of the lock-in amplifier. Due to common mode rejection, the resulting signal will be free of that unwanted dynamic component allowing better demodulation and providing improved signal-to-noise ratio. Next, you should make sure to get your input impedance right. This depends on the frequency involved, the interface to the test sample, cable length and other components. As a rule of thumb, the cables need to be treated as transmission lines if their length is approximately one-tenth of the wavelength or more. In this case, selecting a 50 ohm impedance matching prevents reflections in the circuit, which otherwise result in increased noise and less power into the lock-in input, all leading to a drop of signal-to-noise ratio. If you need to measure the voltage drop at the sample very accurately, it is essential to keep the influence of the measurement instrument to a minimum. This is done by switching the input to high impedance. The drawback may be higher Johnson noise, which can become dominant and prevent you from achieving maximum signal-to-noise ratio. If you want to measure currents instead, use the multi-stage current input of your lock-in amplifier to get the best results. This is implemented as a multi-range trans-impedance amplifier, where the input range and the resulting input bandwidth can be selected. Select the best input range to the smallest range capable to contain your signal, but with a sufficiently large input bandwidth. If you're doing measurements which rely on an external reference, it's essential to optimize the lock to it. An ideal reference signal contains only one frequency with a stable amplitude and negligible noise. To meet these requirements as best as possible, make a careful assessment of your reference source. Choose a dedicated reference or trigger output signal wherever possible. If the reference still contains several frequencies or if it is noisy, use suitable band or low pass filters to optimize the signal. Bear in mind that the locking mechanism is disturbed mainly by unwanted high frequency components in the reference signal. Let's recap these six tips for optimizing the input signal of your lock-in amplifier. Using any or all of them the next time you run a measurement will improve your result and put a smile on your face. If you have any comments or questions, get in touch. We can help. Thank you for watching.